Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. This is a room filled with so many great disruptors, and you are definitely one of them that's pushed the boundaries and you know, has been not only an activist, but also a musician and a philanthropist and been involved in so many different causes and conversations that are so critical to today. So thank you. Um, I want to jump in and kind of start with your background and your story so that people here have a little bit of context. Sure. Because well, uh, I was the first black kid in an all-white town, the first, the only anarchist in a, a suburban conservative high school, the only spandex-wearing, heavy metal guitar-playing, Afro-laden kid at Harvard University, and then I was the only Dungeons & Dragons-playing, Star Trek-loving, Ivy League nerd in the world's biggest political rock rap band. So that was sort of like a resume to kick it off with. Um, short resume. Short resume, but uh, but it, like uh, my family's from a small coal mining town in central Illinois, and my mom did a thing that no one had ever done from that town. She left uh, and spent 20 years traveling the world by herself. She met my um, father in Kenya during Kenya's anti uh, independence movement, and he was part of the anti-colonial movement. My great um, uncle is Jomo Kenyatta, mm -hmm. Kenya's first president. And uh, But my parents split. I was born in Harlem and grew up in a small town, Libertyville in Illinois, which I literally integrated, according to the real estate agent that helped my mom, my Irish-Italian mom and I find an apartment. Um, and, you know, that, that was, it was, it, this was 1965, and um, the real estate agent had to go door to door in the apartment building to ask the other residents if they were okay with his wow. interracial family, me being the interracial part, and how they kind of sold us to the local residents was that I was no ordinary American Negro. Uh, I was a was this African princeling, and that you know that established a toehold uh, at least until I was old enough to date their daughters, and then oh, all wow. that all that went out the window. Uh, but the formative things, like you know, people have often asked me, like, how did you become politically involved and engaged? And it had nothing. It, it Later on, I read Zinn and, and Chomsky, but your political education begins on the playground when you're the only black kid in all white town. And uh, you know, when I was 13 years old, there was a noose in my family's garage. Wow. And there were a number of incidents, incidents like that that sort of informed, I don't know, sort of my thinking. I was always um, on the uh, pacifistic end of the spectrum, uh, but one of the, the, the plot one of the part of the DNA of my art was born of that incident uh, where a college friend asked me, he said, well, yes, I know you admire King and Gandhi, but if the Klan were coming up your family's uh, driveway tonight with another noose, uh, would you rather turn the other cheek or would you rather me and my friends were in the bushes with baseball bats? And that is a question that much of my catalog has turned on for years. That's amazing. Yeah. There's also a lot of um, times that you talk about uh, in that town, in your involvement in the school, being politically active and really sure. engaging your voice to speak out about some of the issues you were seeing. I'd love for you to talk about, you know, being a part of the high school newspaper. Yeah, yeah, the high school newspaper. Was, well, well my, well, my mom was, uh, uh, has always been a political radical, and she is, to this day, she's 99 and a half years old. Uh, and uh, and so, Mary Morello is one of the coolest She people. remains the most popular and radical member of the Morello family to this day. Um, but I was on the high school newspapers with some like-minded friends, and we wanted to write about uh, U.S. complicity with uh, death squads in Central America, about apartheid and divestment, and especially wanted to write about the fact that the dean of students was a dick. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the paper, of course, wanted us to write about prom and the, and the football game. So there was a mass exodus. Uh, and so we formed an underground paper called The Student Pulse. We went up and down Milwaukee Avenue, the main drag in Libertyville, and got advertising for the paper and wrote about Central American death squads, um, South African uh, apartheid and the fact that the dean of students was a dick, uh, and the administration lost their they lost their minds. They were, you know, I said you can't pass down. Of course, it had t three times the circulation of the of the boring paper, and kids loved it. And the, the cartoonist of the paper was Adam Jones, who later served in a band called Tool, and he had skills at rendering the faculty members and their families, which was very popular among the students, less so among the faculty. And uh, so that they said we couldn't pass it out in the, in, in the hallways. And so we call, at 16, 17 years old, we called the Chicago chapter of the ACLU and we said, do teenagers have First Amendment rights? And they said, we'll be right over. Wow. And we sat down with the dean of students and us and the ACLU uh, representative and we taught a civics lesson to Libertyville Public High School they would not soon forget. And it was in that moment that I realized that history is not something that happens. History is something that you make. That's incredible. 
And you also talk about how there's never been a social movement without a soundtrack in music. Sure. Yeah, there's never been a successful social movement without without a powerful soundtrack. I mean, whether it was like the, you know, the uh, uh, the labor and union songs of the early 20th century, the uh, uh, civil rights era songs, the uh, uh, the anti globalization movement had a soundtrack which yeah. featured s some of some of, of my catalog. And I, you know, I've known in the in the hundreds of. Uh, protest shows and charity shows that I've played, I've really found that music is, uh, you know, something in music that's deep in the reptilian DNA and that, and that it predates, so, you know, written language and that the, the tribe gathering uh, with rhythm and rhyme can feel like the truth in a way that nothing else really can. And for a social movement, it can definitely put, it can reflect the struggles and the successes back to that movement, put wind in the sails of people who are doing the hard grassroots work and uh, hopefully steal the spine of, of past, current, and future generations of activists. So I imagine while you're in school, you're getting this wind in your sails, music's helping yes. you, I don't know if the right word is enraged, yeah. but you're starting to gravitate towards music, but you're also really interested in becoming a political activist. Correct. So I want to talk about willpower as a theme for a second, because I think it's one of the really big common characteristics of a lot of the people in the room here, and many people find a point in their lives, especially when they're about to think about going to college mm -hmm. or pursue a higher education, that they need to trade mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. having a career or following their passion. Mm -hmm. You've successfully done both. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd, I find what's so interesting about your story is that you willed yourself into becoming a great guitar player. Yeah. That's true. And I'd love to hear about that because sure. you were also studying at Harvard, which is yeah. not an easy school yeah. to get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I was, uh, um, no one from, I, not, not due to my, let me make this clear, not due to my, any particular genius that I had, I was the first person from Libertyville Public High School to ever attend Harvard. No one ever applied before either, so it was not, a, <laughs> the ceiling was somewhat low. Uh, uh, but then once I got, I didn't start playing guitar until I was 17 years old, um, which is late. I had never heard of another guitarist who had started that late that had ever made an album with the exception of Robert Johnson, who had to sell his soul to the devil to do that. And given my Catholic background, that wasn't on the, on the bingo card. So I just had to practice my ass off. Um, and the best advice that I ever got in the arts was a fellow uh, high school student who was a more advanced guitar player said, if you want to improve, practice at least an hour a day, every day, without fail. He said it as an offhand remark, and I took it as gospel. I began practicing every day without fail. And I noticed sort of the rising tide. Uh, I had no natural ability. But later, I cracked through to some things. But at the start, I fought for every single inch of it. But I noticed when I practiced an hour a day, like the tide began to rise in a, in a measurable way. So then it was two hours a day, four hours a day. When I was at Harvard, you know, I was practicing f guitar f in the stairwell after finishing my I was pursuing an honors major in, in political science. And when I would finish my studies, I would practice four hours a day every single day, maybe missing, you know, fever of 102, exam in the morning, I finished studying at, you know, midnight, I would practice till 4 a.m., not 3.58. Um, but all of that kind of led to amassing technique. And there's, there's, I think there's an important distinction. There are, there are musicians and there are artists. Mm -hmm. um, musicians uh, re require sort of practice and technique. Artists require ideas. And I didn't have those ideas. I was a really shredding guitar player and I advanced pretty quickly. Um, and then when I, when I moved to Hollywood to pursue my rock and roll dreams, um, I could really play my ass off, but I was, there was nothing special about my playing. Um, and the, the, so, so the willpower, and again, I believe it was some compensatory thing for uh, er, other areas where I had less control. I knew with the guitar that it was only up to my will, that the outcome of whether I would be a success or failure of mastering that instrument had to do with no one but me. Like there's not, it doesn't, you know, in, in dating and race relations, this, that, and the other, there's a lot of unpredictable vectors. With regards to the guitar, I just sat in that stairwell and I knew that if I do this four hours today, and four hours tomorrow, and four hours the next day, etc., that I'm going to get somewhere with it. Um, the best thing that ever happened to me was that I was dropped from a label. I was uh, made five years working in Hollywood, you know, in, in local bands, uh, trying to be successful, trying to sort of, you know, impress the A&R person, get signed to Geffen Records. It's very exciting. You know, all my yeah. friends back home think I'm a millionaire. I'm living with like six 
dudes in a squat you know, <laughs> here. Um, but it's my chance to grab at the brass ring. And the band that um, band I was in, we did what the a and person told us. We did what the producer told us. They know, of course, they, yeah. they were the experts. We were the neophytes. Um, and we did everything that they asked. We made a record that was substandard with possibly the worst name for an album in the history of Western music. I'll tell it to you now. Something bitchin' this way comes. <laughs> So it did. <laughs> you haven't heard of that one? Uh, so, <clears throat> so we were, we were, so the best thing that probably happened was we were dropped from the label. Um, and at 27 years old, which is old uh, to begin afresh, uh, I had had my grab at the brass ring and I had failed, but I was still a musician. And I remember, you know, we each got about like a severance pay of 500 bucks and I was done. And I, but I was still a musician. I vowed to myself that I was never going to play another note of music that I didn't truly believe in. And that's when I began writing the riffs that would comp comprise a good deal of First Rage Against the Machine record. And it's that th the thread from that moment, deciding on that couch in, in West Hollywood, that I was the North Star forevermore. It was gonna be songs with ideas that I cared about, music that I really loved, and finding people to do that collaboratively, which is for, uh, 22 albums later, 21 albums later, we'll leave the something bitching off of it. 21 albums later, like every note of music has really been from the heart. And that's continued in, in, you know, in the areas of activism as well and being trying to be as uncompromising as possible with that vision at every step of the way. And during the pandemic, um, you know, while we couldn't get around, like I decided to take that even further and I formed a production company called Commandante that is trying to tell those stories that the songs hint at in a in a broader way, but with the same guiding North Star and uncompromising vision. And I love that. And, you know, I'm so happy you're talking about your process for finding your sound, yeah. which I think a lot of us here can also relate to as we're trying to innovate and we're iterating through that. Can you talk a little bit about how yeah. you iterated through finding your sound? Sure, that's sure, really interesting. sure. So I was a great shredding guitar player at 20, 22, 23. Um, by when, when my band got dropped, one of the things that the producer didn't want on that first record was some of the more eccentric sounds that I was beginning to make. So after we got dropped, I was like, I began deconstructing the instrument. And and look, just the, the electric guitar is a relatively new instrument on the face of the earth. Um, it's a piece of wood, it's some wires, it's some electronics that can be manipulated in a variety of ways. Every article I had ever read from my Guitar Heroes had said, it's all been done. You know, there's a couple of benchmarks, there's Jimi Hendrix, there's Eddie Van Halen, Jimmy Page, whatever. But, but it was, there, there were guardrails that were up. And as I began sort of, like, I didn't care, like, I had nothing to lose. Like, there's no, a, there, there's no vision of a future in which there is a commercial endeavor that involves anything I'm going to do artistically. And so I just did what, I just sort of started making sounds. And if the, I made a mistake, I would repeat it 16 times and make it the cornerstone of the sound. I began practicing. My, my influences went from guitar players to the lawnmower going by, the police helicopter overhead, a trip to the zoo, and the inspirations went far beyond um, sort of the traditional ones. I, I had this kind of inspirational mood board of, of things that I would think about, and some of this is going to sound crazy, but it was, it was the comedy of Richard Pryor. It was the <laughs> daredevil evil Knievel, and it was uh, especially... Um, the racehorse secretariat, who in 1973 won the Triple Crown with sort of astounding feats. And I remember watching the Belmont Stakes, where this horse won by 31 lengths. It's a supernatural feat. It's like if someone scored 200 points in an NBA game or something like that. It was a supernatural event occurred. And I remember watching that as a kid and crying, because it felt like it, was, it, wasn't some, it wasn't something great was happening. It was like the, it, the idea of horse racing was forever upended by that event. And I said, that's what I want to aim for in the electric guitar. I want to aim for that. Not just playing a good lick or a good riff, but to find, a, like, to put that antenna up and to bring, try to bring down the things that are going to be, one, uniquely me, and the two are going to outflank what had come before. That's incredible, just being inspired by real life events and sounds you're hearing and being able to translate that into yeah. music. And so I imagine you're experimenting with your sound. You mentioned you joined a couple bands. A lot of us know you as being a member of Rage Against the Machine, which yes. feels like the perfect way to combine your political activism and passion for that yeah. with sound and music in your voice. And you guys join the band, you're starting to get a lot of traction in Europe, but you're having a hard time breaking in through the U.S., That's which correct. is ironic when we're talking about sound and voice because you're being censored <laughs> in a correct. way. That's correct. Um, 
And there's a story that I love about how you guys are fighting in a way with Viacom. So now you're yeah. trying to get your music video to be played, yeah. but they're restricting it. And you and the team, and I believe at that point there was another creative label involved or something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, come up with a master plan. How did you outsmart them? Well, to pay your well, music well plan? Viacom was this kind of evil empire corporation <laughs> that ran MTV and they would watch every video that was submitted and had some arbitrary standards and practices that would decide whether you could or could not be on MTV. And they certainly didn't want uh, uh, profane language. Uh, now, Rage Against the Machine songs are replete with profane language. And so, uh, and the band refused to censor any of our own music, which would have been the easy route. You just sort of bleep them out. So in Europe, they don't have the same standards. So we were actually a pretty fairly large band in Europe. Uh, there was no internet, so I had trouble convincing my friends in Hollywood, like, we really are big in Europe. But, um, uh, but we couldn't get a video on, on, on MTV. So, so it was actually the record company's idea. We were... Uh, uh, Supporters of Leonard Peltier, the American uh, Native American activist who was uh, falsely accused of a crime. And so the record company said to us, trying to out punk rock Rage Against the Machine, they said, We got an idea for the next single. And it should be the song Freedom. It's six and a half minutes long. It does not have a chorus. There's nothing you can sing along at all to in the song. And we want to give you guys the money to make a video to try to free Leonard Peltier, like daring us to say no to that. So we couldn't say no to that. Um, but the secret motivation was that it was a song that did not have any cussing in it. So, um, so we make the video. It's a tr tremendous video with you know, sort of. It's, it tells the story of Leonard Peltier's um, you know, wrongful uh, prosecution. And I'm sitting in the back of the tour bus with our A and R guy. He's very proud that they've got. We've got the final letter. He says, "What do you think? We watch it through. What do you think?" I'm like, "We're doomed." He's like, "What do you mean we're doomed?" He's like, "There's cussing in the video." He's like, "There is not. We have had a team <laughs> of litigators like going through this forensically to make sure that there's no cussing." I'm like, no, no, it's not in the lyrics. It's in an extemporaneous remark that Zach De La Rocha makes where he says, when the beat's about to drop, he says, bring that shit in. And then the A&R guy says, well, we're doomed. Um, and so I'm like, well, what if, what if he's not saying, bring that shit in? What if he is saying, bring the shatine? Shatine is the Aztec word for freedom, right? So what if we're not bringing the shit in? We're bringing the shatine. We are bringing the freedom. Now... Is shatine the Aztec word for freedom? Does it matter at this point? As far as Viacom <laughs> knows it is, because they, they put that shit on MTV and we, we sold about three million records and invigorated the Leonard Peltier freedom campaign. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love that story of that music video, but there's so many other stories behind so much of the other content and music yeah. videos that you guys were involved in. And one specifically that I also love is the music is the making of the music video for Sleep Now in the Fire, oh, which dear. Michael Moore yes. directed. Yes, yes. And this audience specifically, I think, would love to hear this story because you guys made capitalism grind to a halt on a Tuesday afternoon. Yes, it was quite an afternoon. So Michael Moore was, I was a big fan of Michael Moore's. I'd never met him before, and we asked him to um, direct a video for the song Sleep Down the Fire. Now, one question I couldn't wait to ask him when I finally met him, because of all of his ballsy displays of disruption, it was like, sorry, Mike, nice to meet you. How many, t dude, how many times have you been arrested? He said, I've never been arrested. I said, well, I laughed, and he said, well, you've never worked with Rage Against the Machine before. So anyway, Mike is a man of few words when it comes to uh, directorial content. So we had, first of all, Mayor Giuliani had vowed that Rage Against the Machine would not play on the streets of New York City, right? So there was, so we had a permit to play in the steps of the federal building where George Washington took his oath of office. So we had a, a permit to play there. We had no permit to play on the city sidewalk. So Mike's sole instruction is uh, like, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, don't stop playing. Like, okay, that should be easy enough. So um, when a band is making a video, we're not actually performing the song. We're sort of playing at the time to a CD. So there's like an alternate sound source. We're miming along to the song. We're on the federal steps. Traders, day traders are walking by. Curious fans are like looking up. It's very interesting. Then Mike says, okay, now we're going to go down to the sidewalk. I'm like, okay, cool. So we go down to the sidewalk. And we begin miming once again. The speakers are blaring. And a New York City police officer comes up to me and he says, you got to get back on the steps. And, and I, then I remember what Mike said. He said, no matter what happens, don't stop playing. Well, this is an instance of something happening, and I'm not going to stop playing. So I continued, and he's like, get back up on the steps. 
And now I don't know what, how much experience any of you have with uh, angry police officers. <laughs> I have some. And there's a thing called the cop vein. There's a vein. There's a vein that begins pulsing in the neck of a police officer when shit's about to go down. And his, his vein is starting to get apoplectic. He's like, get back on the fucking steps right now, right now. And I be, Mike said, keep playing. So, -na 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 -na. so he reaches down and he unplugs my guitar. And the music doesn't stop. <laughs> and the look on uh, his face is one of religious awe. <laughs> he doesn't know how music videos are <laughs> he, made. He has no idea. Like, like, he unplugs the bass. He's grabbing <laughs> microphones and drumsticks and still... -na 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 -na. Like, and he, he really can't believe it. And he's, he, it's, like, it's like there's these warlocks that have just arrived on Wall Street. So he does the only... Terrified of us, obviously, he does the only thing he can, which is arrest Michael Moore. So he, he puts Mike in, in handcuffs. And as Mike's being led, led away, he gives his second directorial edict of the afternoon, which is, take the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> now, this was not in the video treatment that we had read when we signed up <laughs> for the video, but in for a penny, in for a pound. And so we put down our guitars, which are still playing, and march through the, I'm the first one through the doors of the New York Stock Exchange, where I see sort of a guard in a frumpy outfit, say, I'm here to take the New York Stock Exchange. What direction is that? <laughs> he hits this red button and like sirens go off and the, you know, the riot squad comes and the, like they have riot doors in the New York Stock Exchange which come and like Rage Against the Machine stopped capitalism on a Tuesday afternoon uh, to the tune of bah, nah, 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 nah. So that's that. We love that. <laughs> when other bands make videos, it's not so dramatic, honestly. It's like, it's... Uh, <laughs> They don't have as much of a mission. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> okay, so one final question. Yeah. We're sitting in a room composed really of a lot of change makers, disruptors, yeah. and largely capitalists who, yeah. you know, you put out a halt on a Tuesday afternoon from yeah. their work. Um, in your opinion, looking at the agenda, which we've had some time to talk about, sure. what is not going to be discussed today that you think should? Well, um, I mean probably capitalism's destruction of the planet may not be high on the agenda until Al Gore gets here. That may be the case. Uh, but I mean, I, I'd say less like what question is on the, on the agenda than, than like, like, what is your life about? Like the, I, the way I look at it, like the world is not going to change itself. Um, that is up to you. And by you, I don't just mean the venture capitalists here. I mean the security guards and the people who are going to be serving, you know, your, your lunch and catering the party later on. Um, that any progressive, radical, or even revolutionary change that has ever happened has happened from people with no more power, intellect, resources, uh, ideas than anyone in this room. I mean, I just spent, um, a couple months ago, I've been doing a lot of union work, and I went down to Alabama where the coal miners had been on strike for over 500 days uh, against warrior Matt Cole, um, and talking with them, and I was talking to this one fellow, and he said, like, He's familiar with my music. He's like, I, I'm not a radical. And I, I said, well, what do you want? He said, I just want a decent life for my family. I said, that's the most radical thing in the world to want. Because if you start pulling that thread, the whole sweater unravels. You can't have that without challenging an oligarchical monolith that is keeping you down. Warrior Met spent seven times as much money to break the strike as they would have had to, to pay what, the, what they had wanted. And so recognizing that history... Doesn't, isn't something you read about in books. It is something that you, you have your hands on the wheel and hopefully uh, can make a decision and a determination to follow a North Star that changes it in a direction that uh, creates a more healthy, decent uh, planet with uh, more equality and justice, peace and freedom for everybody. And there's a lot to take from that, especially with a lot of the people in the room who are trying to affect that change, yeah. whether it is by innovating and building new products that make it easier to affect change, whether it's through social platforms or products that make it easier for people to find work. Yeah. And hopefully the people here can actually invest in those ideas and bring yeah. them to life in a way that progresses society. Yeah. And I suspect that those ideas will come you know, from secretariat moments and things that are unexpected and things that outflank that which has come before. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Appreciate that. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.